Hello. <laughs> Welcome to uh, my very first Lisa talk. My name is Misty Hall, and uh, this talk is titled Year One, Transitioning from Application Engineer to InfraSec Engineer, which is an experience that I have had this past year. So to start off before we even get to the agenda, agenda I just wanna uh, make clear some assumptions I have about why you might be here at this talk. I assume that it's at least one of these things that you wanna improve your hiring or mentoring process that you have at your current uh, employer. You want to reduce new employee attrition, maybe. Maybe you wanna avoid hiring one type of person. If that's the case, thank you so much for being here. Or um, the jokey part, you like fish. I have a, I've decided sort of arbitrarily to make this fish themed, fish themed talk. Um, Cause hiring is like fishing, right? I think that's true. There's, yeah, it's like fishing, definitely. So a little bit about me, it's only fair to tell you a little bit about me since I told you the assumptions I have about you. I am here, my why, my personal why, to help you help people like me help you. We're out there, there of course are application engineers who would absolutely love to be interested in infra or be involved in infra. Some people want to transfer to infra engineers. Some people are just sort of infra curious, uh, sort of, I hope I can help, help you tell the difference, uh, or at the very least, just share my experience uh, with a little bit of, uh, I understand it, survivor bias. Uh, a little bit about me, <laughs> you can see there's a picture of a fish monument here, it's totally normal. I live in Eufaula, Alabama, which is the bass fishing capital of the United States. Don't mean to brag, but we, I have a monument to a fish named Leroy Brown, named after the song. And uh, if you've seen Parks and Rec, Leroy is the, Leroy is our little Sebastian. And this is the life that I lead. So to the agenda. Uh, I have told you the assumptions of why I think you're here, also about me. This is sort of a case study, eh, loosely. It's a sample size of one and a couple. There's a lot of anecdotal bits in this, but I still think that it's valuable you know, to hear people's experiences. Sharing our experiences seems to be a sort of pivotal part of Imprasec, and I would like to continue in that tradition. Hopefully you get some value out of this. And I try to answer some questions based on just my experience. So take that in context. Um, should you? One of the first things I want to talk about is should you even hire an application engineer? Some things to consider. I think maybe there is a push because there's so many application engineers interested in, you know, AWS or whatever. Um, but there's other things to consider. Uh, then I want to talk about slot limits. Who gets thrown back, maybe? Possible reasons for that. And then uh, iced fish is basically <laughs> my assessment of the, uh, what do you do after you've caught one? Uh, last thing is opportunities, sort of opportunities for improvement or to you know, make sure you're setting yourself and the people that you hire up for success. Uh, so first thing, should you even fish in this pond? Uh, <laughs> You don't have to hire an application engineer just because we are everywhere. Um, there's plenty of fish in the sea. Some of them might meet your needs and some of them, you know, might not. And uh, I guess the thing that's important here in this talk that I'm going to talk about, of course, there are tons of reasons you'll have think of for things you'll have to consider. Um, are there's two main factors that I'm gonna argue. And that's that uh, whether or not you hire an application engineer boils down to your technical context and your budget. And these are very like close to the metal considerations. Of course, there's culture and there's, you know, fit and, you know, your specific relationships that you have with people. But for this talk, the scope is just these two, technical context and budget. So let's talk about those. How complicated is your technical context? Uh, you know, hiring is fraught with difficulty. Uh, I have 
I have hired before. Um, I have um, obviously just got hired and transitioned not too terribly long ago. Um, and the complexity of your, your project might decide whether or not you decide to hire an app engine and transition them, which is in essence like rolling your own infra engineer. Um, so even if you're, even if your application engineering team is really strong and you don't need somebody who can code, right? Uh, if you need something like an observability specialized infrasec person to be on call to support application engineers who troubleshoots Golang microservices for your platform as a service, you definitely need somebody with enough coding confidence to have those conversations with your application engineering team. Um, and you may want to start with an infra curious backend application engineer hire because they may be a better investment, so to speak, to getting what you actually want. Um, in my case, I, it made sense. Uh, I was one of those hires from the first big growth waves at the agency where I work. Um, I think I'm, I'm employee number like 57 of 123. <laughs> uh, we do quite a lot of government work at the moment. And, you know, that's since changed. But uh, I applied, actually applied originally to an infrastructure position. And they knew I was interested, but wanted to see my back end engineering skills because I didn't have a whole lot of infra experience. I really didn't have any. So uh, I worked as a backend engineer for like four months, I think, it, until the company grew a little more and they needed more infrastructure people eventually. And then I switched over. Um, and, you know, because products can vary wildly at an agency, I was considered a good investment. So what's your budget? You know, money is going to come up in any talk. So here it is. <laughs> I think that this fish looks like they're asking about your budget. I don't know. Uh, you know, senior specialized application engineers are expensive, and so are very senior infrastructure engineers. So sometimes those hires just don't make sense. Um, but, you know, cross training a mid level application engineer may make a lot of sense and can allow you to get the specialty engineer, infrasec engineer that you want, like the observability person I mentioned. But you know, if your app engine team is really strong and flush with cash and you know, has already hired a lot of senior engineers with some expected knowledge of your cloud provider, then maybe they've done part of the work for you. And it makes more sense uh, for you to hire somebody different, somebody that has nothing no specialization in application engineering at all, such as, uh, let's see, not a fish, but instead a network specialist, which in this metaphor is hush puppies, or an IT person, which is completely separate, like pork chops, <laughs> or an affordable infrastructure specialist with lots of security credentials who supports app engine, manages AppSec team, field sales calls, handles new compliance issues, and respectfully sits in on C-suite meetings while being on call, which I call the impossible burger. You're welcome. I went there. Bad joke. Not even about fish. So <laughs> transitioning away from that joke of questionable value, I want to talk about slot limits. So let's say it makes sense to hire a mid-level engineer with some infra ways, infra tendencies, right? Um, maybe they have an AWS certification. They've expressed some some desire. They've they've already gone to the trouble to learn a lot of Docker. This is, you know, somehow you feel like this person is is would make a good infrastructure candidate. So. I want to talk about slot limits. If you're not familiar with this phishing terminology, slot limits, um, it's a limit that like game wardens set when a fish is too small and needs to be thrown back. Like you, you, you know, you can't catch too many small fish because they just don't, it's not worth it. They need to, they need to grow so you, they can actually be useful. Um, so 
I would say in my situation, um, it made sense. I was considered a mid-level engineer with obvious expressed interest in infrastructure engineering. Although, you know, looking back, I was probably just an undervalued senior, my official story. Um, so well-played employer. Systems level thinking is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's literally a different way of processing um, information than coding. And I think that if you're thinking large, it's sort of maybe easier to scope down than to scope out. And a lot of infosec engineers don't give themselves credit, enough credit probably for that, that swat switch out that you have to do mentally, um, that context switching, which is very large. Um, and, you know, being interested in Lambda deployment just does not an infra engineer make is, is you know, my point. Um, in, in my case, I was not the first catch. I was probably, I was, think I was about the fourth or fifth app bench hire, if I remember correctly. I also, before this talk, I spoke briefly to an application engineer who tried infra and she decided to go back to application engineering. And she said, that the reason that she went back was she just didn't like the work. She just wasn't into it. She tried it, she didn't like it. And I kind of understand that because a year ago, I, I had a really bad attitude about Docker. Um, I'm still not sure my attitude is great about it, but you know, Docker is pretty fundamental. You have to, <laughs> you know, Docker, Fargate, Kubernetes, like these are things you kind of, you kind of need to know, you know, you need to be able to operate uh, in that environment at the very least. Um, and uh, I had a bad attitude about Docker because of the culture, the culture surrounding the tool. And I hope that makes sense to to some of you. Um, since then, you know, it's, I can I can you definitely use Docker. Um, but my point of bringing this up is that you have to be willing to sort of take a little bit of a risk if you want the reward of that product specialized if for person. Um, keep going, don't beat yourself up or get you know hurt if the first fish or two has to be thrown back, you know. Keep fishing. If you've decided an app eng knowledge base would be a vital asset to your infra team, it's it's worth it to stay the course, you know. Something will happen. If you've decided this type of person would be a good fit that type of person is out there. So what now? Let's say you hired an application engineer and they like the work and they, or they're there and they're learning tools and they're ready and they're motivated. How do you set this person up for success? First of all, congratulations. You've got through probably the hardest phase. Um, you can see the metaphor here is fish on ice. <laughs> so what do you do with this person now that you have them? Uh, and in my situation, I, you know, I have opinions about this because there were no specific explicit expectations about growth or tooling. And that is a double-edged sword. It's very nice and also, um, there was no organized mentorship structure, also a double-edged sword. Um, this is something that I honestly suffered for a while without. Uh, I do have a mentor, a wonderful mentor. She's fantastic. Uh, but I, I, I struggled with not understanding the direction that I even had the choice to go in. Um, I think engineering, is just very well doc documented, like application engineering. You have your T-shaped engineers and they're X, Y, and Z. And these are the things that you can specialize in. And as an application engineer, I already had a specialty. Um, I had previously worked in a cryptocurrency FinTech. I worked for a company that was the largest Bitcoin to fiat settler in the United States. And so I, ha I had my specialty, like I felt very confident and I knew my language. You know, I knew a couple languages really well. And so it was sort of difficult to make that switch. 
to infrastructure engineering because I was like, what do y'all really even do, you know, beyond <laughs> AWS stuff? Like I was very confused at first. Um, and so I started looking at some, <laughs> I remember very specifically, I started looking at some infrastructure job advertisements. I was like, okay, what do people in this field value? Like I can ask the senior engineers, but they, have their own sort of view and they're reluctant to sort of impose that on me. And I appreciate that. And at the same time, like, what, are, what is even valued? Like, what are good skills to have in this area? And <laughs> y'all, we cannot even agree on like a, the name for the job. Like <laughs> there's, there's DevOps engineers, there's systems engineers, there's SREs, there's regular infrasec engineers. There's lots of IT positions like masquerading as infrastructure positions and vice versa. It's very like it's very nebulous, all of it out there. Um, and I think after I looked at these job like advertisements, you know, on LinkedIn and like wherever else they post jobs, it, it, I left feeling even more confused about what I was supposed to do. Um, I mean, so there were some consistencies, but like it, it, it didn't quite help me in the way that I had hoped. It didn't quite point me in a direction. Um, and I think that when the job, the positions are that like dispersed, it's difficult to agree on core competencies because it's just very broad, you know? And, uh, the good part though, I think about hiring an application engineer in this specific situation is that a confident engineer has the wherewithal to ultimately see all the vagueness and avoid, like be aware of what is it analysis paralysis and just sort of self-direct and just, you know, just do something, right? Like, I think, you know, I, it's obvious I couldn't, I couldn't launch K8s my first week, but I could definitely write a Terra test, right? I mean, I understand exactly, you know, about the IM user in RDS, but I can I can write the test. I can make make it work, you know. I'm driven to do that. Um, but before you hire, my my point is, before you hire an application engineer, um, or at you know at least after you've hired them, get your senior engineers in a room and make them hash out, you know, for an hour, their expectations. Like what should an application to an infrastructure engineer be able to do after one month, after three months, after six months, right? Like when are they ready for a project? And those estimates don't have to be written in stone, but have some sort of guideline because that's definitely something that I would have benefited from uh, when I first transitioned. And, and since then, my company has these like core competencies sort of defined in a rose chart. Um, but I, I do have to say like, you know, it, as an application engineer or an infrastructure engineer, it, it really stinks to be between two senior engineers with strongly diverging opinions, like in the moment. You know, like it's best if some of that can be worked out before it's blocking what should be a fairly easy technical win for a new engineer. And, you know, it, it's just something that like reduces a lot of friction for both the new people and the senior people and will help your team, you know? So anyway, after a little time working on internal company resources, doing some open source module upkeep, that type of thing. I got put on a project, it's fantastic. This, this is my first project. This is a description of my first project, it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I feel extremely fortunate, not just to be on a project finally, but also uh, because of my colleague context, which was very, very welcoming. I feel really grateful um, just to work with so many senior people. There's a lot of uh, trust is we are infrastructuralists. So 
the infrastructure people that we have are very experienced. Um, they're very talented and they definitely, I have benefited from working within that context. Um, <clears throat> the project type that I got put on, it was a government project, it was not a commercial project. We do have those. Um, and there's some of the hard skills listed here that were sort of expectations of awareness. Some of these things I had had a little, I touched on, but mostly I, you know, had not. I'd worked in commercial AWS. GovCloud is different. It's different in some significant ways. And uh, some of the things that we're working with now are not FedRAMP. So it may have to change. Like for example, CircleCI, I believe is not FedRAMP. So we may have to use GitHub Actions. Uh, I think Jira is not FedRAMP, but whatever. Uh, there's, uh, I, I look at this list of hard skills and I feel really proud because I think um, it shows me how much I've learned. Uh, I uh, was working in startup land before I started this job. And so transitioning from startup work to government was its own sort of whiplash. But because I'd been on a government project as an application engineer at the place where I worked at, at Trust, um, it was, it was this, this was a good project, a good first project for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first most significant reason was I was buttressed by the colleague context. context. Um, the, there were very senior engineers, three very senior engineers, two of whom were like infra specific. The security engineer also does infrasec stuff, but you know, like their specialties um, were were this. And then there were two junior engineers. And when I say juniors, like we're experienced engineers. Um, I don't even know that junior is the right word. I was junior. I think just in the sense that it was my first infra project, but the tendency to like dig down and find solutions is is sort of an engineering expectation that I, I don't know about I don't know about these labels, but the point was there were two more senior infra engineers, um, and I could hit the ground running with low level stuff like internal Terraform module upgrades and you know ECS tasks running cron jobs and container upgrades. So that part was gentle. It was a gentle transition to like a real project. Uh, most important part for me probably was the standard that was set for continued and frequent pairing. Um, agency work, you know, people tend to roll on and off projects as needed, as new, new needs come up. It's very fluid work uh, in terms of labor. And so there was some opportunity for me as well to revise run books, run book entries with senior engineers. And so I got that context before actually being handed part of the technology to work on. And I actually was given the opportunity to work on those projects. I wasn't just, you know, the docs chick who just did all the documentation, secretarial work for the senior engineers. It wasn't like that at all. Um, and now, you know, I'm proud to say I can I can work on these things. So, uh, application engineer integration opportunities. Historically, application engineers and infra, infra are sworn enemies. <laughs> uh, even though I was learning sort of relevant tech, I think I still felt unmoored and outside of everything. And so, a turning point for me that made a big difference in my longevity at, at my current employer and my ability to feel like I was part of the team came when uh, a couple of senior engineers uh, started a group called the InfraSec Book Club, which was not a book club, but was actually a discussion of a, like various infra talks um, from past conferences by folks that uh, are, you know, well known in the field. They're respected in the field, like Alice Goldfuss, Liz Fong Jones, John Alspa, Chas Blackwell, other really knowledgeable people who helped me understand things like, you know, blameless incidents, like controlling, controlling the room, and making sure 
blameless incidents happen are a part of infrastructure engineering culture, um, which you know helped model things like good documentation and leadership qualities, uh, which are things that you know I don't know which are you know not necessarily soft skills, but partly that are really critical to being a good infrastructure engineer um, that you learn beyond just your organizational level, you know. Uh, another thing you can do is mentorship with clear expectations. And I mean granular things like senior engineers should set, should set an hour a week on their calendar to, you know, when they're available to answer questions. Uh, I say this because it has been my experience that very senior infrastructure engineers are, <laughs> y'all are like wounded people who have spent, who have been on call for decades <laughs> dealing with, you know, I can say it because they're one of my own, like application engineer hubris, <laughs> um, who are horrible at setting boundaries. And, you know, if you're a nice person, they'll just let you ask too much of them and run them ragged without complaining to you. Like, <laughs> and I know some of the people who mentored me and helped me out at the beginning would never admit this to me. But in my junior infra phase, my most junior infra phase, <laughs> I'm sure I unknowingly asked too much. And some guidelines around those time expectations would have been helpful for both of us to just to have that set it would have been a politeness to both of us. Uh, Cause you know, I don't wanna take advantage of people who are trying to help me. That's, you know, jerk move. And you know, to be honest, fried employees are bad for product quality. We all know it, they're bad for business. So to, continue this fish metaphor, although it's delicious and tempting. Avoid fried fish. <laughs> and I will, I'm sorry. Last fish preference, I promise. The end. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Thank you for, uh, you know, being here. My very first Lisa talk. I appreciate you. You can find me on LinkedIn. I am the first Misty Hall that comes up. Uh, a special shout out to my mentor and personal hero, Chastity Blackwell, who presented at Lisa 19 and you know inspired me to be here today. Uh, I hope you got some use out of this and that you enjoy the rest of the conference.